Hi, um, I'm Kurt Lee. I'm a CTO of Catch Fashion, and also I'm a AWS Serverless Hero. Today, I'd like to share my experience of how Catch Fashion built a serverless ML inference service with our AWS Lambda. So today, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. But first of all, I'm not going to talk about a collecting data or training model or some basics of TensorFlow just because we don't have time for that. Um, Beside from that, I'd like to start from what was the actual feature we were trying to make? What was the, the actual problem the user had we were trying to solve with the machine learning techniques? And then we're going to talk about the actual journey to a serverless solution for um, ML image inference. And then I'm going to cover some quick tips and advanced topics about um, for future reference, especially for tips, the things that I wish I had known when I was starting this journey. So let me let me uh, briefly introduce what the Catch Fashion is, first of all. Um, Catch Fashion is a pretty small startup that makes a luxury fashion meta search platform. So we have about over 20 retail partners, including major ones like Farfetch or Matches Fashion. Then we gather and updates about 2.5 million products information, pretty much in real time. And then we let users compare the same product from different retailers. So this is the biggest biggest um, thing that we do here. So in the luxury fashion market, it's actually quite common to see a same product on a different retailer because there are like very handful of brands that make the same products. And then if the product is popular, every retailer will want to have it. But the problem with that is that each retail, retailer will use their own categories and size and brand and even images for same products. So users really having a hard time to find the same product from different retailers. So we, we aggregate and then we merge those products from different retailers, even though it's the same products. And then we let users to compare the price and track availability and find stocks, the product they want to buy. So the, what was the user problem we were trying to solve here? So basically, the problem was that there's just too much data. So, so for example, this is the, one of the most popular products of 2020. It's a Balenciaga Speedrunner sneakers. It's around like $800. So because this product was so popular, pretty much every retailer had it. So from the far left image, you can see a there are five retailers that have this product, and then three retailers still has a stock, but all different price, and 12 of the retailers are already out of stocks. And then we since we merged those product, those five retailers, um, we actually have a singular product but has so much data in it. So in, in a center image, you can see this really small like slide bar that represent like all the image slides. So in a far far right, you can see like there are 62 images for the single products. So like five retailers have each of them have like 12 images. So we end up having like 62 images for just single products. So this obviously caused some problem because each retailer used like different style of images. Like some retailer would have a background, gray background. Some retailer doesn't have a model shot. Some retailers would have a always have like model shot in a second image, and some ret some retailer would have like have a model shot in the first place. So it's just very confusing. And then because there are 62 images, like user cannot scroll all the images to the like end. So product team like kind of sit down and talk talked about this, and we find this very chaotic. So we wanted to find some solution to give us give user to like 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 look through those in a print kind of sane manner. So we kind of come up with the idea of like, can we just at least categorize those product like images in a two group? So basically we, the idea we thought we had was users, when user looking at the products images, there are two big different needs. One is to see a detail of the product, how it looks like, what's the color, the like really close up images. And another needs that we kind of thought, talked about was that like users want to see how product looks like when they actually wear it, and then how how should how should they mix match with the other items like jeans and all that. So we kind of talk, talked about it as a pretty simple feature. Like, wouldn't it be nice if we just categorize those like a lot of images as two groups, where like a, like a model shot from the product shots. So technically speaking, this is pretty straightforward. So First, we have to figure out how can we how can we classify whether a given image has a human body in it or not, and then also we have to we had to do this on a 
very high tra traffic fluctuation. So traffic fluctuation, what I mean by that is uh, retailers usually have uh, this concept of drop. So when the new season start or new products lines are introduced or new brands introduced, they usually like register hundreds or even thousands of products in a really short period of time. And then there is no way for us to know it beforehand because it's dropped. So this usually happens around like 2, 3 a.m. in the Korean time. And then there's no way to like know it beforehand. So thus there is no way to handle this manually because we don't want to have like one engineer like stay up all, all night just to make sure we don't have a drop. So the problem was to simply that solving this like inference basically under very high traffic fluctuation. So for obvious reasons, we thought this as a somewhat serverless problem because like there's a test that has to be done and then and the test is pretty straightforward, but then there is a really high traffic traffic fluctuation. So we want to be able to do this in a like automatic manner. In other words, like on demand manner without having a like a like a desert, like a preserved um, resource. So we made a checklist about can we go serverless? So basically what we were trying to do was to have this um, sim pretty simple uh, ML model that does inference that this, this image includes human body or not. So first of all, can we like load the model to a memory? I mean Lambda for serverless purpose. And Lambda supports maximum three gigabytes of memory for, and then some models, this is not enough, but most models that you guys would use, this is more than enough. Like, for example, the, the mobile net, a pre-trained model that we're going to use for proof of concept, it's actually smaller than 300 megabytes, even if you load to a memory, so that's more than enough. And getting input, like API gate gateway support, all kind of SP requests, we haven't really used it, but it even supports like binary like uploads, like uploading images to a API gateway directly also like completely makes sense. Um, there would be like, can we run model? Can we actually run the inf inference in a Lambda? Um, Lambda doesn't really have a GPU, but also unless you want to do really real time like machine learning inference such as like video processing or something, like having CPU is more than enough for most of processing you want to run. So that, that's been handled. And then, like lastly, returning output. So returning the prediction. API gateway supports all sort of uh, HTTP response, even including binary like responses. So that wasn't a problem too. So because because in the catch basket we already built a whole system, not only web server but also like background workers and all that in the serverless. So this was a very natural like steps to take. So we start from the kind of proof of concept. Can we really run any sort of a TensorFlow JS models? So we use a API gateway for receiving inputs, and also we connected Lambda for like actually running the inference. We built, a, we wrote a code in a TypeScript and Node.js. Uh, for most of you guys, this sounds kind of alien because it's quite natural to use a Python, but just because <laughs> Every other um, code we wrote in the catch fashion was all written in TypeScript and Node.js. We kind of wanted to test out is it possible to do it in TypeScript and Node.js. So we did that. And also we use a TensorFlow.js module, which is natural if you want to use TensorFlow on a TypeScript. And also we, we started from a pre-trained model called MobileNet. I'm sure a lot of you guys are already familiar with this pre-trained model. It's really popular. Anybody could use it. It's just a image, simple image classification model. So code, code on the right, what we did is pretty straightforward. Um, it's less than 40 lines of code. We just receive an image URL as an input, and then we download the image from the internet to the Lambda. So, and then parse those, in, parse, parse those image into a bitmap buffer, and then load the buffer into memory, and then convert the memory in the buffer into a TensorFlow a receivable tensor and then run the inference with that tensor and then return the output which is probability of uh, classification usually so that's it that's that's how that's how we got started just uploading that 40 lines of code to the uh, code to the lambda and then that's that was it that kind of worked so as a result with that code i wrote i showed a previous slide if you put like an image on the left, which is Corgi, 
Then after like about 2.5 seconds, you receive the response on the right saying it's a, there's a 52% chance that this is a cardigan corgi and 47% of chance of being a Welsh Pembroke Welsh corgi. Um, yeah, even though it's, it's actually Pembroke corgi, not cardigan, but the point is it works. A mobile net definitely worked with this. And then this is basically this already serverless platform, so anybody can just call the response, call the service without any limit on demand. Everything is fine. Good. So we that's how we got started, and then we start to add more feature of after the future iterations. Um, and then the first one of the first iterations we added was using a body Pixnet. So this is also a pre-trained model that anybody could use. Also uh, has a library for TensorFlow.js2, which is a not only not only that not only it shows it tells human body in it or not, it actually tracks the exact joint. So in an image on the right, you can see a small red squares. That's uh, actually the joint human human body joint that extracted from body PixNet. So even though we started from a really simple question, can we tell the image include model human body or not? We actually end up having doing more, which is we could even tell the human not only human body in it, we could even tell the model is looking front or not by like finding the uh, face joint. So if there's a there's a body but there's no face joint, that means like model is looking back, and then there's face joint, we know that it's looking front, and then looking like that, we start at more and more models, and and then we ended up having the right image where. We can even track the boundaries of an object when there is a coordinated shot. So you can see the green boxes for human body, uh, pants, and even like and small things as shoes on the bottom. And that was that was the that was it. So we had this microservice that basically, if you put image URL, returns all the information metadata. You could say that you can see on the right, and then we just use that to say is this human like model shot or not. And then we just classified it and showed it in the user. It was that simple. Um, let me let me check on on little more advanced topics. So how about custom models? Like I only talked about pre-trained model like MobileNet or BodyPixNet. I'm sure a lot of you guys want to know how would you uh, do this with the more um, like custom models you guys trained. Uh, if you go back and see the code that I've used for proof of concept, actually the Lambda itself doesn't really have model in within the package. So what it does is when the Lambda is started, it actually download the model from the S3 on a runtime, in a cold start. And this this might sound a little strange, but actually this works pretty well because if like downloading the model from well, downloading data, any kind of data from S3 to Lambda within the same region is actually really fast. It's like like if the model is like 200 megabytes, it takes less than a few seconds to download it. So actually a really stable way of uploading the model. Even though if the model is really huge, this might be might, might pause some problem, but usually not. So when you have a custom model, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to a, make a pipeline where you upload the model to the S3. You could call it as like model CICD. So something like retrain the model from the latest data every day, and then just upload this model to a given location on S3. And the Lambda just, anytime you cold start, download this model from S3, and then that's it. This kind of ensures a kind of smooth, continuous model rollout. So it's not like when you have a new model, you have to re-upload or restart, force, force restart all the Lambda. You just let the Lambda run. Anytime Lambda reach, reaches the uh, container lifecycle, it restart, and then it starts to use a new model. So that's it. Then you have the serverless applications that automatically like, use the latest model, like, kind of smoothly, continuously adapting the new model. Um, lastly, I want to talk about some little more advanced topics, mostly about the uh, performance of TensorFlow.js. So one one thing you might you might you guys would notice when you start to adapt this kind of approach is that TensorFlow.js is kind of really really slow. So there are three different implementations of a TensorFlow.js. There's pure JavaScript, native C++ bindings, and then uh, WebAssembly implementation. 
So the problem with that is like pure JS TensorFlow implementation is really quite slow. So I, I set 2.5 seconds for mobile net. If you actually use a pure JavaScript implementation, it takes about 10 seconds. So it's, it's still doable, like Lambda's, Lambda and API Gateway support maximum 30 seconds, but I mean, it's slow. So one way of avoiding this by using is by using native C++ binding. Problem with that is it's bigger than 300 megabytes. So you have no choice to use Amazon EFS. You can mount, the, you can upload the bindings to the EFS system, mount that into a Lambda and load that. Um, this is kind of crumblesome and the EFS is quite expensive, but it kind of worth, worth it sometimes because you're literally 20 times faster than pure JavaScript implementation. So the example that I showed you before, like mobile net, actually let, take less than 200 milliseconds to run the image com compared to 2.5 seconds. And one other um, go around about this, if you really don't want to use EFS, is actually using a WebAssembly implementation, which is kind of, which might sound also kind of weird because WebAssembly obviously is supposed to be run on browser, but they actually made it uh, safe to run on Node.js too, so you could just use that. The reason why I recommend it compared to native C binding is because it's really small, it's like less than 10 megabytes. So you could just simply replace it with a, from the pure JavaScript implementation without doing any rear EFS or anything like that. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. I hope this was helpful for your uh, for adapting a machine learning model to like Lambda and serverless applications. Um, I hope I hope it helped. Thanks. And please complete the session survey before you leave. Thanks.